Thank you. So I'll describe a construction of uh, graph-induced multilinear maps from lattices. This is a joint work with uh, Craig Gentry and uh, Sergei Gergunov. Uh, so just to set the stage, multilinear maps is a tool. It's a very powerful tool. It's useful for many things. On a very high level, the thing that it lets you do is it lets you take quantities that you care about and encode them in some way that on one hand hides them, on the other hand still lets you operate on them. So at least in that respect, it's very similar to homomorphic encryption. Uh, the main difference is homomorphic encryption is a very all or nothing story. You either have the secret key or you don't. If you don't have the secret key, then sure, you can compute as much as you want, but when you're done computing, the thing that you have in your hand is a ciphertext and it's completely meaningless to you. Uh, alternatively, maybe you do have the key, then you can decrypt the result, but then you could have decrypted also the intermediate values or the inputs. Um, and the special ingredients that uh, multilinear maps have is that it lets you leak some information about the result of a computation. In particular, it lets you test whether that result is equal to zero without letting you decrypt it if it's not zero and without letting you um, um, learn anything about the intermediate values of a computation. Um, and such a partial leakage is very, very powerful. So you can do many things with it from multi-part non-interactive key exchange through all kind of strange and wonderful uh, encryption schemes with all kind of strange and wonderful properties uh, to code obfuscation and, and many others. Uh, but of course, implementing this very limited leakage that only lets you do that little thing and nothing else uh, is hard. Um, the previous construction of multilinear maps, uh, they are all based on some homomorphic encryption schemes. Uh, on a very high level, what they do is they give you a defective version of the secret key that's good enough for testing uh, if something is a zero, but not good enough for uh, decryption. Uh, there's one based on Entru uh, due to Garg, Gentry, and myself, and one based on uh, integer homomorphic encryption uh, due to Coron, Lapointe, and uh, Tibocci. And uh, in some sense, they're alge very algebraic, and indeed, there were that gives you structure that you can exploit when you attack them. Uh, the feeling of these attacks, um, uh, Tankred will talk about it later, is you have many things that uh, pass the zero test, many encodings of zero, uh, and you use them to set up a system of equations, and then you solve that system of equations. And in all of these attacks, one ingredient is computing GCDs, either over integers or over, or, or over ideals in some number field. Uh, but my point is there's a lot of algebra going on there. Uh, so, and then just, again, Tankred will talk about it. Uh, uh, the CLT13 version was fixed to protect against these attacks. Um, so before I talk about uh, our own work, let me just uh, give some very high level uh, lay of the land of what kind of attacks we have and what kind of uh, schemes we have and when does a particular attack apply. So I'm not going to be very specific here, but essentially when you talk about multilinear map, there are two modes that you can use it, either a public encoding or private encoding. Uh, when you have private encoding mode of usage, then you you require a trapdoor information in order to encode elements. So only the entity that generates an instance can generate encoding in that instance, and everybody else can only compute on those uh, encodings. Uh, this was modeled as multilinear jigsaw puzzles. Um, it's sufficient for many of the obfuscation scheme, maybe most of them. Uh, and for the most part, none of the attacks that we have touch this mode of attention. If this is all you need, uh, we have very, very few attacks and they're very weak. Um, on the other hand, the public encoding, you want to be able, for everybody to be able to encode or at the very least to re-randomize existing encoding. This would be randomized uh, encoding and you want to take an encoding of a value and generate a fresh random encoding of the same value. When, to do that, you need to publish some more stuff for everybody to use, uh, in particular encoding of zero, and this is needed for key agreement typically, 
many of the hardness assumptions actually either need it either to state the assumption or to use it. Uh, and in this setting, the original um, uh, encoding schemes of uh, GGH and CLT are basically completely broken. Uh, and CLT15 fixes it, so maybe it, uh, in, uh, CLT15 can still be used in, in this model. Yeah. So you need to add to publish more stuff, and if you do, then these attacks apply. That's basically what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Can't you use this to attack the private encoding? No, because you don't, in a private encoding, you just don't, I mean, if your application is such that you don't need to publish those things. Damien? Yeah, it's another question. Can you do a key agreement from obfuscation? That's a good question. Yes. I, think, yes. I think so. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, that thing, where is this? This thing mostly refer refers to the published, uh, the, you know, GGH had a key agreement and uh, CLT, I think, had the same thing, pretty much the same one. Those things are, uh, do need that. But yeah, you can build out of obfuscation. Yeah. You can actually sort of take the obfuscation scheme, assume that they're strong enough, and try to build multilinear map from them. That's another thing you can do. Um, when you say broken, what does it mean? I mean, there are lots of assumptions you can make on this. Basically, you can recover the encoded values. If you have, a, if you have an encoding value, you can uh, recover the plain text. Recover. This is as broken as, as you can get. Okay, but not necessarily uh, learn the private parameters? Not necessarily learn the In CLT13, every attack pretty much recovers uh, the secret parameters. In GGH, not always. But you do get the ability to, you know, I mean, the key exchange is broken. Any, any, I can't say that the scheme is completely broken to the ground, but I don't know of any application where it's not broken for that application. In the public encoding. Yeah. So what I'm talking, gonna, going to talk about in this uh, talk is a less algebraic. It only uses standard lattices and trapdoors. There's no, there are no ideal lattices, at least in the basic scheme or how to factor integers. There seem to be less structure to exploit. There are no GCDs or not, no obvious GCDs that you can compute. Uh, and it's based very loosely on a different homomorphic encryption scheme, the one uh, due to uh, Gentry, Sahai, and Waters. Uh, in the basic settings, you still only get private encoding. I mean, the basic setting is still broken if you try to add to it things to make it public encoding. Uh, but you can still do key agreement that we don't know how to break, uh, I think. Uh, it's graph-induced. I'm going to say what that is in the next slide, but it makes it a little harder to use than the other uh, schemes, at least in the basic settings. I will talk about variants that make it more functional and perhaps even say for public encoding, I'll get to that in the last couple of slides in the, in the talk. Um, some of this talk is going to be technical, so before I get technical, I want to uh, have my sales pitch. If you do use these variants, you get a construction that's as useful and as secure as anything else that we currently have. So use it to all, for all of your multilinear map needs, including if your needs are uh, cryptanalysis. I think this scheme deserves more cryptanalysis attention than it has received so far. Um, are you talking about the efficiency to other no, I will not. <laughs> um, it's a, it's, so what are you going to compare it against? If you can compare it against CLT15, it's not going to be very different. You may have, uh, you know, square root of the security parameter difference. Uh, it's the, con the complexity is similar. Uh, I mean, whether one of them is security parameter to the fifth and the other to the 5.5, I don't really remember, but it's not very different from the others. Uh, what is graph-induced multilinear map? So the thing is, every instance of this construction is, comes with a graph, and the graph tells you which operations on encoded value are uh, valid, you can actually compute. Um, it's similar to the levels that you have in the other uh, constructions, if you know what these are. Uh, you have a graph and encodings, plain text element would be encoded relative to edges in this graph. Uh, so here's a simple example. You have a graph with four uh, vertices and four edges, and you have an encode, an, a, 
a plain text value lowercase u encoded relative to the edge from 1 to 2, and what you get is the encoded value, which here is uh, denoted as capital U, and similar other uh, plain text values that are encoded relative to other edges. Uh, the once you have these encodings, the operations that you can do on them is you can add or subtract encoding relative to the same edge. So V and W are encoded relative to the edge from 1 to 4, so you can add them uh, or subtract them. Uh, I should say it's not edges really, it's paths. I mean these graphs <coughs> by implication is always a transitive closure of. So the DAG that you get is really a transitive closure of a graph. Uh, you can also multiply matrices uh, that are on adjacent uh, edges in a path. So u and x are on uh, one, one edge after another in a path, so you can multiply these two matrices. Uh, and what you get is an encoding of the product u times x relative to the path from 1 to 4. And once you have that, then you can add and subtract it from uh, v and w. And you can uh, zero test. If you have an encoding for that, part, for that version, let's say that any encoding anywhere in the graph, uh, you can test whether that thing encodes a zero or not. Uh, so this is the functionality uh, that uh, graph-based multilinear maps give you. And there, is, there are some, sec yep. Yeah, so just to make sure, so the graphs are acyclic? Yes. You can make it cyclic, but then at least the basic form would be broken, and I don't know about the variance that I'll present at the end. I didn't think about it. So uh, you think they're always transitive? If this is transitive, it's Yes, it's yes, it's a transitive closure always, yes. And actually, it's more than that. I mean, you can sort of, without loss of generality, or almost without loss of generality, assume that there is a single source and a single sink. I never try to, to really characterize what kind of graphs are useful there, but... Uh, just like uh, a path, uh, I mean, it's not, uh, if it's a cyclic and trend. Let me, at the very last slide, I talk a little bit about what graphs are useful, so let me get zero there. Only... Zero test, for now, zero test is any encoding anywhere in the graph, but you can have variants where only the source to sync things can be zero tested. Um, and you need some security, so the very basic uh, property that you want, which is necessary but not sufficient for anything, uh, is that you cannot recover the plain text encodings from and the plain text values from the encodings? Um, sorry, just one more question. So, when you can multiply, can you multiply? Really, is it two paths that? Yes, are? yes. If you have two two encodings on two paths on the graph, then you can multi if they if they are consecutive, you can multiply them and you get an encoding relative to the concatenated path. I don't think it uh, corresponds to a graph structure. I, I, I was trying to think about it. I don't think it corresponds to a graph structure. So security is more like a one-way function than semantic security? Well, you would need much more than that. But you would say that a scheme is broken if that doesn't hold. right? I mean, I, I'm not going to talk about uh, security assumptions at all. Uh, I'm just going to present this uh, scheme as it is. And then you can make whatever assumption you have. I'll describe to you the essentially only attacks that we know how to mount, and you can, this attack breaks that. Uh, so currently, partly because not too many people have looked at it, we're in the setting that either you can completely break it or we don't know anything at all that you can do. Uh, so here is a simple application that you can try to implement from that uh, non-interactive but multi-party key agreement. So in this case, three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, they want to agree on a key. Uh, in our setting, there are some public parameters that everybody know, including the attacker Eve. Uh, and you want a scheme where each one of them just independently broadcasts something. And once everybody heard everybody else's broadcast, then they can agree on a secret key. Whereas Eve, even though she knows the public parameter and heard all the broadcast announcement, doesn't know what the key is. Uh, so here is one way to do it based on uh, graph-based multilinear maps. Uh, we're going to have uh, three chains, one for Alice, one for Bob, and one for uh, Charlie. And Alice would encode the same value on 
one edge in each chain would pub would broadcast the values on Bob's and Charlie's uh, chains, but will keep the value on her own chain to herself. And similarly, Bob will do the same, and so will Charlie. And then the shared key is just A times B times C. Each one of them has a chain where it knows all of the encoded values so they can compute an encoding of A times B times C. Uh, but Eve is missing one edge on every chain, so she can't. How do they recover? Right, so there's a question that now they have different encodings of the same value. How do they recover the value? Let's say that they can. I didn't, I mean, the interface that I described doesn't actually let you do that. It does let you do it if, uh, you know, each one of them either encode the right value or not, and then either they, they get a zero or a one, but that's a little complicated. And these schemes, at least in their basic form, always let you uh, extract some random uh, value out of an encoding. So I didn't talk about it. Yeah. With there, so far, there is no assumption. So far, there is only functionality, right? And this and this thing, if you want this to be secure key exchange, assuming that you get the functionality as per Anna's question, then you would make an assumption saying it's a secure key exchange, and it would translate to some assumption, not particularly natural one, but some assumption on the underlying encoding. And so you had a picture of a graph, and you explain how. How would these edges in versus me? Are you, so are you going to show us that for every scheme you need a different graph? Actually, graph? At, at this point, every scheme, so here, for example, every key exchange scheme would need that depend, where the length of the, the chains is the, as many as the number of parties. Um, this scheme, like if you want to do obfuscation, which I'm not, by the way, I'm not going to talk about it other than showing the picture, you need a single chain uh, whose length is as long as your branching program. Uh, so at this point, the way I said it so far, every scheme would need a different graph, and when you design your scheme, figure out what graph you need. At the end, I will say that actually I don't know of any interesting thing that doesn't, that cannot just get by with a single chain. Uh, so maybe this whole graph thing is just red herring and you always can use chains. I don't know. The way we thought about it initially started from really graphs. But uh, the way I think about it right now, I don't know if the graphs mean anything. So schemes needs a chain and you, if you have a security assumption, uh, if you want a generic security assumption on this multilinear map, it would say for every graph uh, something. For every graph, you cannot distinguish between this distribution of things encoded on the edges and that distribution of things encoded on the edges. That would probably be, uh, uh, you know, if you want to replicate the file pass uh, et al. A, a assumption, then it would say for every uh, sequence of graph and every two distribution of things that are encoded on the edges, if in some generic model you cannot distinguish these two distributions, then also on the encoding you cannot distinguish. This would be the, the structure of the, of the assumption that you would be making. Yeah, so I'm not going to say anything about this, about this slide. Um, so <laughs> uh, let me go quickly through the tools. We've seen these tools uh, over and over again in this workshop, so I'm not going to say much about them other than let you appreciate my color schemes. Um, learning with errors. Some parameters, there's M and N that are the dimensions of these matrices. These are uh, wide and short matrices. Uh, Q, which is a modulus, uh, the decision version of learning with error, at least in this formulation, would be uh, you get a random matrix uh, N by M matrix mod Q and uh, another matrix B, and your job is to determine whether B is a random matrix or whether B was obtained as some secret matrix S times A plus E. So in words, whether or not B uh, the columns, the rows of B are close to the row space of A. Uh, S is typically random and small, but it was shown, uh, E is random and small, and, and S is typically random and small, but it was shown by uh, Applebaum et al. that uh, you can assume that S is as small as E. Um, so that's uh, the, the formulation of LWE that we will use in this uh, uh, work. 
And trapdoors, we talked a little bit less about them during this workshop, but the point is you can sample a pair A and tau, where uh, tau is, a, a is almost uniform mod Q, and tau is some trapdoor information about A. Uh, one particular form of this trapdoor information that would be relevant to some of the attacks that I will show later uh, is if you have a full rank ma matrix T, M by M, this is the big dimension M, uh, it's full rank over the integers, but when you look at it mod Q, then A times T is zero mod Q. And if you have a trapdoor like that, either in this form or any other forms that were proposed in the literature, uh, then uh, you can solve hard problems relative to that particular A. So you can solve LWE relative to that A. Given B, which is S times A plus E, you can find S. Uh, and if, in fact, you don't need this to be an LWE instance. You don't need E and S to be distributed according to uh, whatever distribution LWE is. Whenever you have something that looks like that for a small E, you can find S. Um, and you can also find uh, solve the small integer solution problem relative to that A. That is, if you have that A and you have a target matrix R, you can find uh, a matrix that, uh, when you multiply it by A, gives you R. Uh, and moreover, well, that you can always find. That's just uh, solving a, a linear set of equations. But you can find a small one. You can find a small D, M by M D, such that uh, A times D equals R mod Q. Uh, so with that, uh, let me describe the construction. The one thing new in this construction is this particular way of representing LWE instances. So you have an LWE instance uh, AB. That's the two matrices that you get in an LWE instance. And then you have some auxiliary matrix A prime. Uh, and we want to represent B relative to A prime by a small matrix D such that A prime times D equals B. So we're going to solve a uh, small integer sh solution relative to A prime, uh, which you can do if we have a trapdoor for A prime, but we don't need a trapdoor for A. So the LWE instance could still be hard. Uh, so this is a particular way uh, that turns out to be useful of representing uh, <coughs> LWE instances. And in our construction, we're going to have these matrices A for all the graphs. So you can think of this one as the matrix corresponding to the uh, destination, of, and this one as the matrix corresponding to the source. And then we're going to have, uh, we might have a trapdoor relative to one of them, but not the other. Question? Yep. So this A, B can still be a hard element? Uh, yeah, this, the, that, yeah, that's not a, yeah. That's the assumption. Well, if, if we were lucky and be able to prove any, to reduce anything to LWE, it would be that kind of things that we'll be using. We don't know how to reduce anything there to LWE, so it's not, it's not that I can make that assumption and then prove anything in the statement. This is an, the intuition why the scheme is not broken, right? But yeah. Again, I, I'm not going to have any formal assumptions simply because essentially we don't know how to make them. Uh, so I'm going to describe what I'm describing to you as a candidate. Um, it would be nice to come up with clean assumptions that would imply hardness. I, we just don't know how to do it yet. If you could break LWE, you can definitely break the scheme, if this is what you're asking. Speaking of A prime, is public here? Yeah, in our case, A prime would be public, and actually A will not be, but uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, it looks farther, a little farther than the LWE than you'd think by this description, but yeah. Um, yes. Yes. That's, yes, that's all I'm saying here. Um, so, okay, now we can describe the construction. Uh, we are given this DAG, and of course also the LWE parameter, and MQ. Uh, and for every node, we're going to choose a random matrix, one of these uh, wide and short matrices A, together with a trapdoor. Uh, and the things that we're going to encode are plain text, are LWE secrets. So the thing we're encoding are small matrices mod Q. Small n by n, this is the smaller dimension, matrices mod Q. Um, and once we have 
uh, these matrices A with their trap doors. And we want to encode a value S relative to a particular edge from U to V, then we first just generate an LWE instance relative to the matrix at the end of that path, uh, and then encodes B relative to the matrix at the beginning of that path. So we, have, we need a trapdoor also only for the matrix at the beginning in order to generate uh, this encoding, but think about it, if you want to generate encoding relative to many matrices, then you need the trapdoor relative to many of these. So in particular, in order to, represent, to generate an encoding relative to this edge, you need an encode uh, trapdoor relative to this matrix. So you can, that's why we cannot reduce it to LWE, because then you cannot say anything about the security of uh, matrices here. Uh, but for every individual encoding, at least you can say that, uh, that you can generate it without being able to break the LWE instance. Uh, in other words, if D is an encoding of S relative to the edge from U to V, then you have the relation that A sub U times D is roughly S times A sub V plus a little bit of error. That's, that's the property of encoding that we have. Uh, and if we have that... Uh, so in order to, to come up with this encoding, you need to control the destination. I need to have... Uh, trap door for the source. So does that mean in the key exchange uh, protocol that you showed everybody needs to know the trap door for the intermediate nodes? No. <laughs> uh, so in, to do the key exchange, you would actually go halfway to the, uh, to the public encoding and generate many. You know what? Let me get to the like two slides from here and then answer it. Do I need? Well, let's say that yes. Okay. I mean, S is the secret that you're encoding, so you needed to have a, a high entropy in the same sense that you need uh, the exponent in, in Diffie-Hellman to have high entropy. If you're publishing S. But S is the atom you're encoding, so it's something that can only encode a high entropy. Well, it's, it's an N by N matrix. It's more, you, it has high entropy, but yeah. So, so far, with what you've told us, is, it is true that it's hard to invert the encoding, right? Yes. Based so I didn't, I didn't say what you publish yet, but uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, <coughs> let's, let's go over the operations. Addition, well, if A1 times C is S times A4, and A1 times C prime is S prime times A4, so you have these two encodings, then you add the matrices, and, and what you get is an encoding of the sum of the uh, S's. Um, <laughs> multiplication also works if you have uh, A1 times D is S times A2, and A2 times D prime is S prime times A4. Then you multiply the Ds, and you open the parentheses, and what you get is close to uh, S times S4 times A4. Um, in the previous case, this, the error was just added. In this case, the error has a more complicated form. Uh, it's one error times the encoding plus the other error times the plain text. Uh, so if you want the error to remain small, you need both the encoding and the plain text to be small, which is why we have it this way in the construction. Um, one thing that I want to say here is that if you remember from uh, the first day where we were using this magic G uh, uh, gadget that lets you, uh, you take a matrix that's not really small and then you stretch it according to, uh, along one dimension and you, and you represent it as a small matrix, you could ask whether you could use it here uh, and the answer is not that we know of. I mean, there is one way of using it where the dimensions match, but that one way is broken. Um, so, and the reason is because we're going to make these A's public. I mean, in things like GSW, this A's re uh, represent really the, the secret key, uh, and it's kept secret. Uh, but if you publish it, then it's a problem. Right. Uh, zero test. How do you zero? Yep. So you have encodings with respect to specific vertices, right? Right. So when you when you multiply, yes, relative to edges, right, right, right. So 
When you multiply, you get encoding relative to paths. In general, you always have encoding relative to paths. As I said, you really should think of this graph as a transitive closure of a graph. So, so then when you multiply, is that is the encoding of the result with respect, like what? To the path from the beginning to the end. Okay, so like in your, in your previous example, the, the multiplication is with respect to? To the path from one to four. So you can, it was going to be with respect to that path. So if you had other encodings on this edge, you could have added them afterwards. Which are not really uh, parallel, like I don't know, like I have two paths which so something like this. Not really. I mean, the the thing that you can do is if you have paths that end at the same point, and you can recognize whenever they encode the same value, but you can't do any any operations on them. Which is why I said that really morally, uh, it's always a single source and a single path, a single thing. Um, all right, uh, zero tests. How do you zero test? Well, if I give you the A's, then you just multiply by, by these A's and check that it's small. And it would be small if it's an encoding of a zero, because we said that an encoding of, an, uh, of S relative to the edge from U to V satisfy A times U is S, time, S times A V plus E. So if S was a zero, then you're left with only the error ve the matrix, which is small. So if I give you these A's, um, um, then you can recognize zeros. And if it's not a zero, then A times U is roughly S times A sub V. A sub V is random. If S is not a zero, uh, then S times A V is large. So therefore, so is A U times D. So it lets you uh, distinguish encodings of zero from encoding of non-zero. Uh, so that's the functionality. And you need to get both matrices? <coughs> no, just the source matrix. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I will, I will say, I have like two or three slides at the end about variants. In this variant, uh, I can only give you the, the matrix for the source, and then you would only be able to zero test uh, encoding relative to paths that begin at the source. Uh, but if I want to only let you in, uh, zero test things relative to source to sync, then I need to do something else. And I will, I will mention it at the end. Yeah. There's something I don't understand. So if A sub B is public, then can't you just test for if you have a If you know S, whether you can, yes. If A sub V was public, and I'm not going to give it. I'm only going to give uh, things relative to the source matrices. Uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, at the beginning, I said that I let you test for zero anywhere else. And that's, if you knew S, you could have tested for that. But that's true also. If you have the discrete log in mind, if you think you know what the discrete log, then you can test it. So it's not very different from here. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I give A sub V, then I let you test for every S, whether it's equal to S, which is a somewhat more extended version of the zero test. Um, right. But if you don't give A sub B, then... I only give A sub U, then you can only test things at paths that begin at A sub U, at, at the node U. And that's, I mean, yeah. That's my question again. So <coughs> this is what you need to publish for zero tests, just the AU matrices. And now do we have the property that the encodings are hard to invert even given a zero test? Based on even if you give all of the A's, yeah. then you still, not based on LW, no. Uh, if, right, if you only have a single edge, I can prove it based on LWE. Anything more com interesting than that, I cannot. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to break it, but I can't reduce it to LWE just because the fact that if you need, in order to generate these encodings, well, I can do it. Uh, some, something, one thing that's a little more interesting than a path is everywhere except one place, there's at most a single matrix, and in one edge, there are many matrices. That I can still reduce to LWE. But that's it. That's, you're saying this specific graph? Oh. I'm say, if I have a particular labeled graph, graph of things where uh, it's a one chain, everywhere I have just a single matrix on all of the edges except one. On one of the edges, I can have more than one. And on this thing, I can say that if you, I'm not even sure about the uh, publishing the original. I think I can still show that uh, it's hard to recover the original thing based on LWE. Not sure. But it's not, a, again, it's not an interesting graph in the sense that 
you can't really do anything with it. Um, all right, who can encode? This is, uh, I think, uh, Evgeny asked a question related to that. You need to know trapdoors to encode. You need to know the trapdoor of the source matrix. If you want to encode over a path, you need to know the trapdoors of all the matrices but one. Uh, so it's private encoding. Uh, you can go beyond private encoding by uh, generating many uh, enco random encoding of random S's and just publish those and then you can take a, a subset sum of them or maybe a Gaussian uh, linear combination of them and using the Gaussian leftover hash lemma to claim that the result uh, is an encoding of, uh, of a random S. Um, and there is a question of whether or not it's safe to, pub to make the SIs public. In some version of it we know that it's not, in other versions we don't know, but let's assume that you don't need that, uh, that you don't publish it. Uh, the key exchange protocol that I described before was written the way it was written so that you can do it, so that you can run it without publishing the encodings of S. And so that we don't know how to break it. So it's, it's essentially a private key uh, encoding scheme. You can go slightly beyond pri private key encoding, but not very much. I mean, if you try to go too far, we have attacks. And I'm going to show you the main attacks that we have now, uh, just to show you what, uh, what, the, what the issue is when, when you try to work with this. Um, or you can have a community version, uh, event. So far, the plain text is a matrix. If you remember the, the key exchange example, they were computing them in different orders, so they actually don't get an encoding of the same thing. Uh, if you want them to get an encoding of the same thing, then you need the plain text operations to commute. So you can work with one by one matrices, and that would work, except you need to work over a larger ring, because otherwise the LW instance would be easy to solve. Uh, so you walk over larger rings. I mean, you, you take one of these cyclotomic rings and you walk over them. And then you get n equals 1, m is going to be log q. Um, and even in this case, I want to stress that the encodings commute. Uh, the, so the, the uh, encoded values commute, the encodings do not. The encodings are still log n by log n matrices, so they don't commute. So you can still only multiply them in the order, in the prescribed order. But the thing, the value that's encoded there, you can compute it in many different ways, yeah? So this is saying to actually do, uh, to make these A matrices now single row yes. over a row. Yes, yes. But could you not also work with just a sub ring of N by N matrices that correspond to uh, this R here, but leave the A matrices as uh, You can, but do you th does that give you anything? Well, so it would allow that, I mean, it makes the plain text space equal to R while still making the LWE matrices, you know, N by M. Yeah, you can do that. Over ZQ. Over ZQ? Yeah, over ZQ. But then your, your LWE secret is then just a single... No, it's, a, it's still a matrix, but it's, it's a, from a subring of matrices that correspond. That commute? Yeah, they commute because they correspond to the ring R. Yeah, that... It's... Plausible. Okay. I didn't think about it, but yeah, I think it, well, I think it does work. Um, all right, so let me describe the attacks. Uh, there's essentially one, and it's that. Uh, if I give you an encoding of zero, what is an encoding of zero? An encoding of zero relative to the edge from V to W is a matrix D such that A sub V times D is small, which means that it's almost a zero. Now, if it was exactly a zero, D would have been a trapdoor for A sub V. Uh, and the attack is just observing that you can use D as if it was, essentially, as, as if it was a trapdoor. Uh, essentially, anything that you can do with a trapdoor for A sub V, you can do with this matrix, which is almost a trapdoor. And the way to, do, to see that is, well, now we have A sub V times D equals E, where E is small, but we want it to be equal to zero, so let's make, let's make it zero. If I know A sub V and I know D, then I know the matrix E, so I can just look at the matrix minus D on top of E, and that, I mean, I multiply it by A sub V prime, which is A sub V with the identity, then I do get zero. So this is closer to being a trapdoor, not quite a trapdoor yet because it's not full rank. Now A sub V prime has M plus N columns, and this matrix is only of rank M. 
Uh, so I need a little bit more, so let me, let me get a little bit more. Suppose I have two encodings of zero relative to that edge. So now I have two of these matrix minus D over E, and I just concatenate them. And now I have enough columns, and with high probability, uh, I get enough uh, linearly independent uh, columns, and then I get a full trap door for the matrix A sub V prime. So I started by encodings of zero. I get a real working trapdoor for a related matrix. It's not exactly the matrix A sub V, but it's close enough, and it's close enough in order to break. Now I have a trapdoor for this. I can break LW on this uh, relative to encoding on this edge. So now I have a, an arbitrary encoding uh, on that edge. Um, and uh, right, so I have an encoding uh, of C relative to the edge from u to v, so a sub u times c is s times a v plus r, and I'm going to call a sub u times c the matrix b. If I know a sub u, I can compute the matrix b. Uh, I want to have an LWE instance relative to a u, a v prime, not a v, so I'll make it an LWE instance relative to that matrix just by concatenating zeros. Uh, now I have B prime times S equals S times A V prime plus E prime. Uh, plain text is small, so that thing is still small error. It doesn't really comply with the LWE uh, distribution, but we don't care. I mean, we can use trapdoors to, to solve, uh, even if it's just a BDD instance. So the moral of this thing, if I have zeros with respect to V, time, v to going to U, so I can have zeros relative to a path in the graph only in that if that path begins at a source, because this is the only case where I will never see instances where that trapdoor helps me solve them. So that's, that's the moral of the story. And you can actually extend it. So you don't need to have uh, uh, an encoding of zero you can, uh, on a path. You can have an enco two encodings of the same value on two paths that lead to a, um, a mutual endpoint. And you can repeat then the, the previous tricks. Um, and then if you have encoding of the same thing on all of these edges, then you can find it, That's that thing. Uh, and you can even extend it some farther. You can have encoding of different S's on many paths with a joint endpoint, as long as you know a small linear combination that annihilates them. Uh, and I've all, I mean, I'm not going to go through that because I'm a little out of, out of time, but uh, all of these things. Um, uh, work just the same. So these types of attack, since it's essentially the only attacks that we know how to mount, they suggest a generic model. And the intuition is if you can get trapdoor, then the scheme is broken. If you cannot get trapdoor, then the scheme is as secure as you could possibly hope. Uh, it is a generic model. It's credible in the sense that, well, for all we know, these are, this is the cryptanalysis landscape here. Um, and you can actually formulate what does it mean to get a trapdoor. It's an encoding on paths with common endpoints that we know how to annihilate, and none of these paths begin at a source. Um, it should be possible to formalize. Uh, it should be not particularly hard to prove uh, security of various schemes, in particular obfuscation schemes. Uh, and we really don't have any meaningful attacks beyond this generic model as of yet. So it would be also interesting to find ones to get a, a better understanding. Uh, so, so if you have a zero test, but you're not allowed to have encodings of zeros. You can have encoding of zero on paths that begin at the source, but not any other paths. It's okay. It's just like this low-level versus not low-level uh, level encodings of zero in the other uh, multilinear maps. Here too, if you have encodings of zero relative to paths from source to sync or from source to anything else, then the only trapdoor that you can get is trapdoor relative to this uh, A sub E, and, and we don't. We ne you will never see an LWE instance relative to that. Uh, you have an encoding of zero that uh, sits close to the source, and you allow. It's a path that begins at a source. Any path, any path that you multiply would still begin at a source. You can oh. never, you can never push the, the beginning of the of the path anywhere else.
again, no. The, the path that you get is source to sink, right? I mean, you multiply one uh, matrix on every edge, you get a matrix relative to the entire path. So no, if you don't, I mean, if these S's that you publish are kept secret, then you don't know how to annihilate them. And if they're random, then you don't get encodings of zero. You get encoding of random S's that you don't know what they are. So yeah, that's, I admit that it looks like a, somewhat of a lame defense, but no, I don't know how to use it. Not in the key exchange uh, application. I need to publish encoding of random stuff, but not zeros. Right. All right, let me talk about some variants. Uh, these are things that are sort of mentioned in passing in the, uh, in the paper. Uh, the particular presentation is due to some discussion that I had with Ron over the last couple of days. Um, the first thing that you might want to do is say that uh, publishing uh, these small entry matrices D is a little scary cryptanalysis-wise, so you may want to strengthen it. And here is one very natural way of strengthening it. Uh, you just, in addition to everything that you've chosen so far, you also choose a random invertible matrix T relative to the uh, edge, to the nodes except things where uh, you just use the identity. And then uh, essentially you multiply, you replace an encoding C by an encoding TU times C times TV inverse. This is Killian-like re-randomization. The point is this thing is no longer small and the T's are never revealed. Uh, and you need to replace your source by a different matrix, but that's just uh, so that things cancel out at the end. Uh, it doesn't affect any source to sync encoding. And now you can already pub if I publish this guy, I would let you test for zero over a source to sync uh, edge uh, path, but not over any other path, because any other path that would end before the sync uh, would still have this extra thing tacked at the end. Yeah. So the encoding now is, is large. I mean, it's like as big as Q. So does yeah, the encoding get multiplied by the error when you were? No, because I mean, the. The thing underlying it remains the same, and these things cancel out as you uh, as you multiply. Okay. So, so that means you cannot now. If I need to produce, I need to, I need to know the trapdoor for the source. Now I need to know the trapdoor for the source, and the two matrices, one for the source, the other for the sink. You still need trapdoors and all of the T's and everything else in order to generate. Uh, only the generator of this uh, on the, of this scheme. Not an encoding. Uh, previously, I needed to trap only for the source. Now you don't need to trap door anything. To use the encodings, you don't need to know any trap doors or anything at all. You generate encoding. You need all the trap doors for everything. Just one. I mean, well, yeah. Now you now you need uh, now you need more. But the the assumption is you generate the scheme. You generate the encoding to begin with. Uh, you publish it, and then uh, so here is one thing that you can do in this case. This seems to kill the trap door attacks. I don't know how to extend the trap doors attack attacks to this setting. Uh, if it really kills it, then maybe now it's safe to publish encodings of zero, so now you can re-randomize things. Maybe you can even publish an encoding together with the encoded value, and then you can generate yourself by taking subset sums, uh, encode, a, a random element in its encoding. Um, so it seems to uh, let you a lot more, a lot more room to play. And I, again, it's not that anybody has tried particularly hard to break this, this variant, but I tried for a little bit and failed. Uh, and it is mentioned in the, in the paper, but it was not stressed very much. Uh, here's another one. Uh, <coughs> levels. I mean, levels are wonderful. You can do straddling sets with them and stuff. Uh, can't we have levels here? Yeah, sure we can. Uh, just, you know, divide this encoding by a dem denominator Z and multiply the, the product of the ZIs into the zero test and everything works and everything is fine. You do need large rings. Uh, if these Zs were uh, at all, all safeguards and probably both, um, 
No, the safeguards by itself is not enough. You do need large rings for that because otherwise, you, at the end of the day, you have a matrix and you know that there is a, a single scalar such that if you multiply it into this matrix, you get something small. So if this was a scalar over ZQ, then it's a, a lattice of dimension one and you can find it. Uh, so you do need the, the ring to be large uh, if you're going to use uh, these levels, but you can. You can use this level. You get all the levels that you like uh, from uh, GGH and CLT back. Um, and moreover, this is even a little more a little nicer to use than, uh, than GGH and CLT in the sense that it enforces the order of products because you still have the chain and you encode the entire matrix together as opposed to individual elements. In fact, in, in, our, in my discussion with Fran, it seems that you can just use it to encode Barrington as is without any randomization on the side of the co construction itself. And it seems that it's still secure. I mean, you do get the Killian randomization, of course, when you implement the multilinear maps with this variant, but... Um, right. So let me conclude. Only 10 minutes behind schedule. Uh, less algebraic construction. We have this variant with uh, safeguards and levels. That seems to be as good, if not better, than any other uh, alternative that we currently have for any construct, almost any construction that you can think of. Um, it would be nice to understand these, this uh, variant a little better. For example, what happens when you try to use it to encode a very low rank secret? A secret that is really just, uh, um, you know, have rank one. Um, so it's not a zero, so you can't apply zero test, but maybe there you can still uh, just do. Or if not, if, if low-rank secrets are just as safe as any other secret, then you can do subgroup elimination but you, by using eigenspaces instead of these different uh, groups. Um, Here is one thing that uh, I'm just curious about. I can't think, if you have these levels, I can't think of any application that actually needs a graph. They all can get by with a chain. Is there any application that where the graph actually buys you anything? I don't know. Uh, and, you know, the big one, I mean, it's always plausible that you can say under LWE and something or the other, this thing is secure. You definitely need LWE to be hard for this not to be broken. It's not sufficient, but maybe there is some relatively simple to state assumption that would give you, uh, I don't know, multilinear DDH uh, or something. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. So can you briefly maybe uh, explain this key exchange? I mean, initially you explain it in one way, but then it seems like your formalization was inconsistent. So if I want to do key exchange, there is some graph who generates a graph and he gives each person some... So you encode the same... Uh, let me go back all the way there. The only question is how do you do the encoding? I mean, the construction is the same. Right. But the question is, how do you do this encoding? How does Alice do this encoding? So the generator will generate many random uh, encodings on this edge, and encoding of the same random thing on this edge, and encoding of the same random thing on this edge. Uh, and then Alice will just take the same subset sum here, here, and there. Um, oh, I see. So, that's, so essentially, each guy gets a bunch of, uh, you know, everything labeled there gets a bunch of uh, encodings of. Uh, Actually, the same little a on these yes. edges, and then I start taking linear, same linear combination, giving yes. it to people. Yes. <clears throat> so this is a non-pass graph, right? Or you're saying now you can do it with a pass? Right. So if I had the if I had the levels, I could do it with pass. <laughs> not entirely. I'm, I'm not entirely clear about. I mean, maybe maybe you don't even need. Le I mean, for this application. I'm not exactly sure what happens if you just put all of them on the same link. Maybe it's, it also works. I'm not sure about it.